Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, Thyroid Journal Club for uh, this Friday morning. It's a pleasure to have everybody here, and it's really a pleasure to have um, our two speakers, who I know I am personally looking forward to um, uh, to hearing. It um, it's as with every uh, Friday morning, we encourage people to um, write in their questions, and I think we will have. Uh, time at the end of the session uh, to be able to get to those. I can think of no greater impact on the management of thyroid nodules and overall management of our thyroid patients than um, what has happened in molecular uh, diagnostics um, for this disease process. And certainly, um, we're, we're incredibly fortunate to have Yuri Nikifora, um, who's been a pioneer um, in that field. Um, he is a professor of pathology and vice chair of the Department of Pathology at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also the director of the Division of Molecular and Genomic Pathology. Um, Dr. Nikki Forth, in addition to publishing over 200 peer-reviewed uh, articles, um, has also um, uh, published his textbook entitled Diagnostic Pathology and Molecular Genetics of Thyroid, which is now in its third edition. Um, in addition to all of that, he's also an NIH-funded investigator for his research program on molecular genetics of thyroid cancer, thyroid cancer diagnostics, and molecular mechanisms of chromosomal rearrangements. And so it's really an honor to have um, Yuri uh, present this morning, and equally um, a tremendous honor for me to introduce um, our discussant for today, who um, is Zubair Balosh. Uh, who is currently Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, which he joined um, back in 1997. Um, interestingly, I learned um, uh, that Zubair uh, um, is not uh, um, without incredible amount of training. In addition to his medical degree and his um, residency in pathology, he also has a PhD and underwent two fellowship training programs, one in surgical path and the other in cytopathology. And similarly, Zubair has published over 200 peer-reviewed papers, has co-authored three books, and um, um, is considered uh, one of the world's experts in head and neck and endocrine pathology. And so um, with that, I want to turn the program over to uh, Yuri, and I want to just uh, thank both of our speakers this morning for their time um, set aside for this program. So thank you both. Thank you, Mark, for the invitation. It's really my pleasure to be here today and have this discussion, um, particularly in our time when we cannot meet face to face. Really, we really cherish such opportunities. So we start with case presentation. It's a 34 year old female presents with a mass in the neck. On ultrasound, the nodule is described as a solitary nodule, partially solid cystic, oval shaped, wider than tall, with ill-defined margins and 1.3 by 2.6 but by 1.1 cm in size. The solid component is hypoechoic with the presence of a single echogenic fossa. The patient underwent FNA biopsy, which was reported as atypia of unknown significance, but as the three, and consequently, consequently, molecular testing was ordered. Based on the above characteristics and cytopathology results, which of the following mutations would make you feel comfortable performing only a lobectomy due to its association with a favorable prognosis? There are four possible answers. A is a BRAF V600E mutation. B is a RAD CRAS mutation. D, NTRK mutation.
Great. So our poll is closed and we will revisit uh, this poll question at the very end here. Okay. So today we are going to discuss, I wonder if you see the screen with the paper, front page of the paper, do you? Yes. Okay. Today we are going to discuss a, a, a publication in a paper that we published in German Oncology, which is called Performance of a Multi-Gene Genomic Classifier in Thyroid Nodules with Indeterminate Cytology. A prospective blinded multicenter study. This is a validation study for one of the molecular tests that is being offered, which is a CyraSeq, and I'll go today through the main findings in this paper. First, these are my disclosures. So, in a way of introduction, we are going to talk today about diagnostics of thyroid nodules. As you know, those nodules that uh, undergo fine needle aspiration, uh, that have clinical suspicion enough to, 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 to suspect cancer, undergo fine needle aspiration as the most, um, most efficient and accurate diagnostic tool, which is performed usually under ultrasound guidance and yield cells that are sent for cyto cytology examination. An introduction of FNA in this country in the early 1980s resulted in a dramatic decrease in uh, the rate of um, surgeries performed on benign thyroid nodules. However, it didn't eliminate it entirely, and, uh, and this is because the presence, the, the, the occurrence of so-called indeterminate cytology diagnosis. As you know, most of the uh, cytology, cy cytological sort of diagnosis allowed to uh, or cytological exams allowed to the, uh, to place the sort of this you know nodule into either likely benign or malignant category about 75 to 80 percent but still about 20 to 25 percent are so-called indeterminate and for those diagnostic surgery has been for many years you know the preferable surgical option which obviously is not ideal and the the, the Clinical needs, the purpose of most molecular tests is exactly you know, to, in application to this category of indeterminate cytology, which, which uh, uh, if test is performing very well, can predict high probability of benign disease, and these nodules are typically managed as, uh, as benign uh, nodules, and then high probability of malignant disease, and those patients undergo surgical excision. However, if you look for the step, even, even more advanced step of molecular diagnosis, is that probably um, would be something like this. Sort of, it's not only uh, uh, the best molecular test should uh, predict high probability of malignancies, it also should predict if this uh, cancer likely to be of high risk and in those patients more extensive surgery should be performed or of low risk and lobectomy as a therapeutic procedure may be sufficient. Um, also want to, in a way of introduction, want to say that um, over the last years, over the last decades, we have a dramatic progress in understanding of molecular mechanisms of all cancers, including thyroid cancer. Particularly for the last 10, 15 years, with introduction of next generation sequencing, which is a technology that allows us to uh, analyze millions of base pairs, of millions of units of DNA. Really, it has accelerated the process of discovery and using this genetic information into clinical practice. So, in this paper that we are going to discuss today, we, we focused on uh, indeterminate cytology nodules and on the use of this sort of molecular approaches based on next generation sequencing in helping the, the, uh, the diagnosis of uh, cancer in these nodules. Uh, this, uh, this was a clinic, uh, this, this was a prospective double blind multicenter uh, validation study 
eligibility criteria for patient enrollment were above 18, 18 or older uh, years of age. But that's the three to five, that's how initially it was defined with non-surgical outcome. The two years it took to recruit the patients. We had a central pathology review by a panel of three pathologists. Dr. Balosh was one of the three pathologists on this central uh, review panel. Primary outcome was the accuracy of detection of cancer and NIFT-P. NIFT-P in this study mainly was, was added to the group of cancers considered to be within that group because as of now, this uh, in situ borderline uh, or pre-cancer lesion is still considered to need uh, surgical excision. The, uh, as I mentioned, there were, uh, this was a multi-center study with 10 uh, study sites participating, nine in the, United, in the United States, and one was a National University Hospital of Singapore that, that uh, contributed patients to this study. This is a diagram. Uh, this is a flow of patients in the study. Uh, initially, uh, 1,013 uh, samples from 782 patients were, were enrolled. Uh, and it, there was some variability between centers. Those centers that had um, on-site evaluation of cytology I mean, they contributed most of the patients that immediately were diagnosed as indeterminate. In others, all patients were enrolled, and then those that had assessed the one, two, or six were excluded from the analysis. So overall, uh, uh, 663 samples were not were excluded because they were uh, uh, assessed the categories outside of the indeterminate cytology. 350 samples were further evaluated in the study from 318 patients, and then 62 of them were excluded, um, mostly because they didn't have surgery or were withdrawal for other reasons, which left us with 286 sample eligible participants, uh, of which uh, 24 were excluded because uh, the material was not sufficient for testing, and we were left with a final set of 257 samples from 232 patients. Our reviewer asked us to, to compare the demographic and clinical characteristics of nodules in excluded and included patients to be sure that there was no bias in including patients for the analysis, and there was no uh, difference between these groups. So, in a way, uh, this analysis uh, uh, encompass, I mean, or expected to be uh, sort of um, to provide the information on approximately 350 nodules within determinate cytology. In the final study set, we had 154 nodules with Bethesda 3 and 93 nodules with Bethesda 4 cytology and only 10 nodules with Bethesda 5. So, so obviously the study was underpowered for Bethesda 5, and in final analysis, we didn't really spend much time uh, looking into this group. This study is mostly for Bethesda 3 and 4 nodules, which is actually main clinical sort of dilemma that we are dealing with. Finally, uh, Importantly, there was no post and blind case exclusion. This was we discussed between the principal investigators that that will be a very important part of the study, really to stay with, a, with a, to provide a, the highest possible quality of data. We decided that there will be no post and blind case, ex, case exclusion. So this table shows the test performance in buses the three, four, and then combined three and four nodules. So I am going to focus on this combined buses the three and four nodules because I believe this overall provide uh, the most clinically applicable uh, data. So we start with the sensitivity. The, the sensitivity of test was uh, 94% and with disease prevalence of 28%, the negative predictive value was 97%. So in other words, uh, we, 
um, there were 68 cancers in this cohort, out of which 64 yielded positive test results and four yielded negative test results. And there were 179 benign nodules, out of which 146 uh, were called by the test as negative and 33 were positive. When we talk about uh, specificity and positive predictive value, specificity of the test was 82% and positive predictive value was 66%. So in terms of the detection of cancer in different cancer types and different groups, which obviously is very important, uh, among malignancies in this case, obviously the most common type was pectoral carcinoma. There were four follicular carcinomas. We were happy to find that in the final set, we had 10 Hurtel cell carcinomas, because Hurtel cell cancers, as you probably know, are notorious for being difficult to, uh, to diagnose using molecular testing. Then we had one case of medullary carcinoma and one case of metastatic carcinoma. This table summarizes the performance of the test in these groups. 92% uh, of papillary carcinomas were detected. Follicular carcinomas by numbers are a little, a little lower, but we have only four cases in this group. All Hurter cell carcinomas were detected, one medullary, one metastatic, and NIFT-P, all 11 NIFT-Ps were also uh, called positive by the genomic classifier. So what about uh, cases, four cases that were uh, false negative for the analysis? This, uh, this table shows uh, the, the features, three of them were PTC and one was minimal invasive FTC. None had vascular invasion, none had extrathyroidal extension. So we were happy to see that all missed cancers were intrathyroidal, low stage uh, tumor aggressive histologic features. So how to conceptualize the test sensitivity and specificity? In other words, when based on these numbers that we are generated by this study, what you would expect if you have a 100 patients with Bethesda 3 to 4 cytology that underwent molecular testing. Out of those, you expect to see that 61 patients will have the negative test results represented here by, by, by in this box. So so out of which all except for two will be true benign nodules and two will be false positive. I mean false negative, but again those two had, uh, so remember, have low risk sort of cancers. So 61% of these patients may in principle avoid surgery because virtually most of the nodules are benign. And we are talking overall in the cohort about 82 patients with histologically benign nodules will be called negative by the classifier. Then 39 patients will have a positive test results, after which two thirds will be true positive and one third will be false positive. And we are going to talk about this group also uh, soon. So 39 patients would require surgery in this cohort. I want to stress that this is because this is based on the disease prevalence of 28%, which means that, that this is actually probably close to national standard, but yet this data will vary a little bit if the, your pre-test probability of cancer is lower or higher. And we again talk a little bit about it next. But what was really a, a very important point in the study is that the, the positive test result was not simply a positive or suspicious for cancer. They, there were specific mutational profiles or specific mutational groups that were reported in the study, which had close correlations with, with the cancer probability and type of cancer that is expected in these patients. So I'll spend some time going through this table. So there were five groups that represented four main types sort of, of, of diagnostic categories. So about 2% of all uh, test results uh, pointed to a high risk molecular profile. This were patients with, let's say, HRAS TERT or other mutation like MEN and P53 mutation. This molecular profile has very high uh, confers very high probability of high risk cancer. 
Okay, and fortunately there is very few because we do expect them at indeterminate cytology nodules, very few of them would uh, would really be aggressive cancers. Second group is BRAF V600 E like group. In the, there were 12 percent of patients in this group. So these mutations, uh, they which include BRAF V600 E and several other similar type mutations uh, confer very high probability of typically classical papillary carcinoma, which is intermediate risk for recurrence. So this is BRAP group. The third group, the largest group, was RAS-like group, which included RAS and RAS-like mutations. 57% of all test results fell uh, into that group, and these patients had about 60% probability of cancer on NIFTP, typically uh, follicular variant, encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma, many NIFTPs were in this group, a few, few other tumor types. So typically these pa patients, if cancers have a low risk for recurrence cancer. Then there was a fourth group, it was copy number alteration group, as you probably know, most of Hurtel cell carcinomas, they represent a quite a unique type of thyroid cancer that develops through a very different mechanism from follicular papillary carcinomas, through, through uh, this copy number alterations. So indeed, again, I notice in this group there were about 20% of those. They had 60% probability of cancer, 40% probability of benign disease, and that's the group that was enriched in Hurter cell carcinomas and follicular uh, variants of PTC and follicular carcinomas. Also, some NIFTP also uh, uh, were present in this group. And the last group, which is a, was only gene expression alteration group, uh, this group, the, the medullary carcinomas, metastatic tumors will fall into this group, and also some classic PTC, but this sort of group which doesn't represent uh, a separate biological entity and more, uh, and rather the, the combination of different uh, mutation, different tumors that have uh, gene expression profile. So this really granularity of results uh, provide in addition to diagnostic also prognostic information that is important in, in uh, formulating the management plan for specific patients. I'll spend a couple minutes just talking a little bit about the RAS-like group, about tumors that are driven by RAS and RAS-like mutation. Like I, like I mentioned already, about 60% of those were cancers NIFTP, about 30-80%, about 40% were benign uh, nodules. What important to stress that they are benign tumors, they are not hyperplastic nodules. And I, for 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 a couple of minutes, I I want to discuss a couple other studies that really provide conceptual understanding of what really we are dealing in RAS positive nodules, because it's a very common diagnosis and diagnosis that's important to sort of to to conceptualize. So this is a study published last year in surgery from four institutions, all used CIRAC, and they combined their sort of follow-up results on RAS-positive nodules. Those institutions were Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Moffitt Cancer Center, Cedar Sinai in, in Los Angeles, and Mount Sinai Health System in New York. And this diagram shows the probability or the prevalence of cancer or NIFTP in these four institutions, all diagnosed by CIRASIC. So at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, the probability of cancer in RAS positive nodules was 83%. And in the same city of New York at Mount Sinai, it was actually 15%. And two other centers has it between. So you see, this this was the same diagnostic uh, platform used. I um, mean, this is the same city. It's hard to, to believe that there is a difference in 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 ethnic, for example, composition between the two sides. So the question is why there was such a such a huge variability in in cancer diagnosis, cancer NFP diagnosis in RAS positive nodules. Probably the most likely explanation is in criteria that pathology, pathologists use to, to make this diagnosis. In some nodules, 
like it's shown here, I mean, the nuclear features, there is no nuclear features of PTC. In other nodules, there are very clear present nuclear features of PTC. But the point is that in other nodules, we have some or more expressed nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, but they are not fully expressed. And the question, so, and the question is where the uh, uh, pathologist make a cut off in order to diagnose it as cancer or not cancer. I think the fundamental problem with this is that if pathologists have very strict, very loose criteria or very sort of, you know, relaxed criteria to, to, to call these nuclear features, the pathologist would diagnose most of these lesions as cancer. And when criteria are very strict, in opposite, very small proportion will be called. So the fundamental challenge here is that we have a continuum of nuclear features that we have to fit into a binary distribution, benign or malignant. That was the reason why we included NIFT-P as this intermediate category. But the point here is that, that cancer is a multi-step process that develops from multiple steps. For example, if we talk about colon, everybody knows how colon develops the polyps and high-grade dysplasia in situ as an invasive carcinoma. If you think about the same concept, this is what happened in the thyroid and that the tumor develops through multiple, multiple steps. And when it's, uh, let's say, it develops through 10, 10 different steps, and when it is removed to step one, two, or three, everybody will call it benign. And when it's removed at eight, nine, 10 stage, everybody will call it malignant. But then the tumor is, is removed at, st at stage four or five or six. And that's where there is a very big variability in how pathologists call this Tumors. And that's exactly what happened with RAS positive nodules. And that's where the, the one pathologist will call it benign, other will call it NIFT P, the third group will call it malignant. And that's why we see this variability in, uh, in cancer diagnosis in these nodules. This was exactly the reason why we introduced a complex a concept of NIFT P or non invasive follicular thyroid neoplasm with papillary like nuclear features. Because when these tumors are pre-invasive, even if they have nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, there is a very low they have very low risk of cancer of, of, of recurrence. Actually, the risk is less than one percent in ten years, and therefore we felt that they should not be called cancer. So and then the, one can ask question: So how do we how 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 sure we are that these tumors can progress? And Obviously, it's very difficult to, to provide to show the stepwise progression, but the point is that sometimes in one nodule we already see as these different stages of progression from being morphologically very benign to, to looking like a malignant tumor. For example, this is, this is a, a nodule that you see, this is one nodule that has a thin capsule, and we are going to look at three different areas in the same nodule, area A, B, and C. And that's how these three areas look under the microscope. Area A, as you can see, has a lot of colloid, very blunt looking. So this basically area looks like a hyperplastic nodule. Area B already is microfollicular. It has a little bit of nuclear features that's really become kind of a more suspicious. And area C it has a clearly very well-defined nuclear features of papillary carcinoma. So depending on the way you stick a needle, you can get diagnosis of probably benign in what in area a and area b and area c will be positive area b maybe probably will be bethesda 4 and and and, and area c will probably be bethesda 5. but what is important is that if you do molecular analysis separately on these areas all of these lesions will be positive for ras mutations so ras this nodule started as a ras tumor, RAS positive tumor that grew still most likely ha had very blend morphology and then eventually it started to pro 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 progress, started to accumulate nuclear features of papillary carcinoma, still being non-invasive on this stage, so the most appropriate di diagnosis for it would be NIFT-P, but this is a tumor that we believe at least some of them in time will break through the capsule and give rise to an invasive encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma. So, to summarize, RAS positive nodules represent a spectrum of the disease from benign adenomas 
to NIFT P2 invasive cancer. Typically, low risk invasive cancer, it is RAS only. And although some of them are called benign, this is likely, this is first of all for sure a tumor, and second, it does have certain potential to progress to cancer and therefore probably has to be removed. So I want to finish with two other points that were not initially in, in our initial manuscript, but, but were asked by reviewers to add to the paper. One, they ask us to estimate the probability, the performance of CYRA-seq in populations with different disease prevalence. As you know, um, the, the positive predictive value and negative predictive value are not fixed uh, test performance characteristics, only sensitivity and specificity are. And they depend on the prevalence of disease in the population or pre-test cancer probability. So in, if in your cohort there are only benign, only benign nodules, then any positive test results will be incorrect, so PPV will be zero. And then every negative test results will be correct because all of them are uh, negative, all of them benign. So it will be 100%. And if in your population the prevalence of disease is 100%, all of them are cancers. So any neg every negative results will be incorrect. So there will be zero negative predictive value. So negative predictive value with increasing disease prevalence would change from 100 to zero. But what is important, the important is how long the slope stay very high because this determines how good this test is and how robust it can be in different populations. So if we take as a cutoff 95%, we want to be sure that the probability of cancer in, your, in this nodule should be less than 5% or less. So this is your 95% negative predictive value. This correlates with a 40% of cancer probability in Bethesda 3 and actually 60% of cancer probability in Bethesda 4 nodules. So what it means? It means that if pretest probability of cancer in your institution for Bethesda 3 and 4 nodules is not higher than 40-45%, if you combine them together, it's actually 44%. The test is expected to give you the negative test results, expect to give you the residual cancer probability of 5% or less, which is considered to be a threshold when you can observe this nodules. So, really, I mean, again, this is a little bit uh, co uh, complex statistics, but the, 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 it indicates that unless the in your institutions, the Bethesda 3 and 4 nodules have very high probability of cancer pretest cancer probability. This test should perform as expected, which means that negative test results can give you the residual cancer risk of less than 5%. And the second question that the people were asked by the reviewers was to compare the performance of, the, of this CYRA-seq genomic classifier to another most common molecular test that is present on the, in the United States, which is a pharma GSC. We added it as a table, as a supplemental table seven to the paper. So both validation study were multi-center and double-blind study, which in, which included, which were based on a large number of patients, 247 for Cyrus and 191 for Ferma. Age and uh, uh, gender and nodule size were not significantly different between the two cohorts. And in terms of the performance, uh, sensitivity uh, of CYRA-seq was 94% and the PHARMA 91%, which is not statistically, statistically different. Different significant is in the uh, specificity, 81 versus 68%, and then eventually in positive predictive value. So 65% uh, versus 47%. So benign call rate or how many of the nodules are called uh, benign by the test is somewhat slightly different, 61 versus 54%. And this is a percent of avoidable surgeries that can be achieved by these two tests. And I want to finish with a summary. So what these test results mean for how they can be translated to the clinical practice 
when we're dealing with patients with Bethesda 3 and 4 nodules. So you have Bethesda 3 uh, 4 nodule patient that undergoes molecular testing using CYRAC. What do you expect to see? So first of all, about 1% of these nodules will not be follicular cell derived. They will be either medullary carcinoma or, pe or parathyroid nodules or very rarely metastatic lesion into thyroid. 99% of them will be follicular cell derived. And they will be, uh, despite the fact that the test will call them either negative or positive, there are actually six possible scenarios how these results can, can be provided. For negative, for ne there are two categories of negative test results. One is uh, just negative. This is the nodules that have no alterations. The, the residual probability cancer in those is about 3 to 4 percent. And most of them are not even not even tumors. They are benign hyperplastic nodules. And an observation is likely the appropriate management for these patients. There is also a small category, about 5% of so-called currently negative nodules, where we identify low risk or low level alterations. This is likely to be more like a follicular adenoma, for example, benign lesions with 5 to 10% probability of cancer. And this patient may require a little bit more, more close sort of uh, um, um, close follow-up. So we recommend usually active surveillance for this patient. And then when we are talking about positive test results, we are talking about four different flavors of the positive test results. This corresponds to four main groups that we report in GEM oncology paper. The test can be positive for RAS-like mutations or gene expression alterations. And these tumors will have about 60% probability of low-risk cancer. We discussed this. This is your RAS groups that are really sort of, you know, progressing from adenomas through NIFT-P to low-risk uh, follicular variants of papillary carcinomas. And lobectomy appears to be a reasonable surgical uh, therapeutic intervention for most of these patients. Then test can be positive for Hurtel cell type copy number alterations. And this is again about 60% probability and this variability due to nodule size and other clinical parameters. It's about 60% probability of an intermediate risk cancer. Here, lobectomy versus total uh, thyroidectomy appears to be a, a appropriate sort of clinical dilemma based on size, patient preference, and other clinical parameters. Then there is a group of BRAF V600E-like positive mutations or gene expression alterations. These mutations confer very high, close to 100% probability of intermediate risk of cancer. Surgery appears to be clearly an, an, an appropriate management for these patients. And here, total versus lobectomy also will depend on nodule size and many other clinical parameters. And finally, only about 2% of indeterminate cytology nodules will fall into the positive for high-risk mutations. This is this molecular profiles confers very high probability of high-risk cancer. Those patients, like most of those patients, would need to be treated from beginning with, with more extensive surgery, total thyroidectomy, if they be rough-like profiles also plus minus um, uh, lymph node, lymph node dissection, because these cancers are really bad players that will, will mostly uh, contribute to, pay, uh, to tumor recurrence and uh, have clear association in many studies with, with uh, increased chances of death due to, uh, papillus, uh, due to uh, differentiated thyroid cancer. We are talking about not even about poorly differentiated anaplastic carcinoma, but from differentiated thyroid cancer. So that's basically a summary of the, of, the, uh, of the results of this paper and how these results may be translated into clinical practice. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, everybody. Um, and um, 
it's always hard to follow uh, Yuri's act because he always is so comprehensive in describing everything that it, it becomes a little harder. But I'm going to try my best to um, to keep up with his uh, expertise. I, I'm hoping that everybody can hear me correctly um, here. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, what I think is is the slide to really uh, title my slide as a current status of thyroid cytopathology. And I'm going to present a very, some, some of the quick summary slides. And I'm going to follow this up with our own experience with the molecular testing, which is going to be more of a real time um, experience. So, um, so I do not have any conflicts to report. And as you all know, this is the Bethesda scheme, which is, came into the first edition. And I think the beauty of it was that it really reflected what is practiced in the real time in cytology. Uh, nothing is as black and white as just calling everything benign and malignant. And it included really these indeterminate categories, uh, which some of the cytopathologists, us actually, including me, is very hard to say that we call things atypical, but that is real life. So this uh, uh, really, this classification reflected um, the, uh, the real practice of thyroid nodule cytology, and there was a risk of malignancy based upon uh, the literature uh, which was published before this. So this was basically based on literature review. And taking those, uh, that Bethesda classification, this is just my way of showing that what are the main features that you look into a cytology slide, which include colloid, follicular cells, and the nuclear atypia. And you can really see these are some of the examples which kind of fit into these uh, diagnostic categories, which go from benign um, to malignant. And then there is this middle gray zone, which is the AUS plus and the follicular neoplasm. And some uh, authors may even include suspicious for malignancy cases in this. Now, what happens when people started using this classification scheme? We did realize that this risk of malignancy that was based upon literature review. Remember, these most of these studies really represent very heterogeneous populations. Not every thyroid nodule is treated the same in every single institution. We did realize that the risk of malignancy really changed. And this was an excellent meta-analysis, which was published in 2014. And it showed that there was the risk of malignancy really was variable. And this is averages from it. And it, it was kind of more different for these indeterminate categories which kind of range from 24% for AUS plus and 30% for cases classified as follicular neoplasm. Now, when you really uh, look into this, all this data, what it led to for us to really go back and look again and really collect the literature which was being published at that time and also the changes that were happening in surgical pathology and the clinical management of thyroid nodule that led us to really start uh, looking into it and that would generate the second edition. And I did remain as one of the authors on this uh, book also. Now, the biggest change was that there was changes in the risk of malignancies for cases classified as indeterminate, which include the ATP of indeterminate significant and plus, as well as follicular neoplasm. But the biggest change was also that that we is included the molecular testing uh, for the indeterminate categories um, because it was becoming very obvious that still the majority of the cases which were being classified as atypical or follicular neoplasm were going for these massive surgeries which were really needed. And not all patients, all practices were conducive to repeat FNAs and getting another sample, even though this was better, um, the patient really was getting really apprehensive for waiting for such a long time. So the molecular testing was brought into the picture in this second edition. What we also included that this encapsulated non-invasive follicular variant, which is now was being called as NIFT-B. And this, um, as I do have to say, uh, commend uh, Yuri, who really created this entire panel to look at this particular uh, tumor of the thyroid 
which was actually more common and included a lot of variability among experts to diagnose this. So the patients were running from one expert to another. So this NIPTP was included into the, um, into basically as a note format to really tell the clinicians that the things we are calling as indeterminant or suspicious for malignancy even, some of these cases may turn out to be as NIPTP, which is not which is considered as a low risk neoplasm and not classified anymore as malignant. So basically it stayed the surgeon's hand and I apologize for that mark or really have aggressive uh, treatment, follow-up treatment. So now if we just look beyond the morphology of thyroid FNA, we have a lot of data now is available beside FNAs. And I really like this um, uh, paper by Dr. Tawel, <clears throat> which really talks about the dynamic risk assessment and this real-time really a prognosis of thyroid cancers. Because if you really think about it, whatever is diagnosed on cytology, whatever diagnosis we make, the gold standard is still remains just surgical pathology, which also has a lot of variability in the diagnosis. So the clinical, clinical uh, management and how these cases are managed it really is a way to think about these, not just negative and positive, because I think this is all happens on a spectrum. And to me, this risk assessment, um, it really plays into um, how really should be these, what is the optimal management of these thyroid nodules? I know that some of these things need to be tweaked, but this was a good framework to think about from as a part of the pathologist or cytopathologist, how these uh, lesions will be managed by the clinicians. So I think the FNA really plays a big role in the patient management, patients with thyroid nodules, and also plays in this risk stratifications. And that's where I think the molecular data, which is generated on the thyroid FNA specimens, really can start the how this patient is going to behave, what type of surgery and prognosis, and really start even before surgery. And I think this is, there's much more reliability on the FNA diagnosis along with the molecular test. So to me, this is actually how the things are now. And I think this is actually, we should all be thinking about managing thyroid nodules based upon this. Naturally, the clinical presentation, and I think ultrasound has become really good in assessing how, what type of risk will be associated with a given thyroid nodule. And this is also the risk assessment from American Thyroid Association, plus the uh, thyroids from the American College of Radiology. Uh, and then along with morphology and molecular tests can lead to more optimal management of these thyroid nodules. Now, I do want to point out that when the uh, molecular tests came through. There were two naturally main molecular tests, even before ThyroSeq was the Affirma test. Um, and we did realize, and which Yuri also pointed out, that there was a little bit of a problem with the oncocytic lesions, which were being called as increasingly malignant on the first version of the gene expression classifier, and it still was leading to more surgeries of these benign lesions, which were oncocytic on cytology. Now, the current version of the Affirma, which is the GSC, has dealt with it, and it does give better results for oncocytic lesions as compared to the, what was seen in the prior version. And these are the references for you here. Now, Yuri did show the slides, and I just highlighted that this in the new version of ThyroSeq, and I think this was also with the ThyroSeq version 2. There was a little bit of a problem, but with the ThyroSeq version 3, you can see it really does very well with the oncocytic and or the hurtful cell nodules and differentiating between benign, uh, mean, I mean non-neoplastic, as well as the neoplastic lesions and separating benign from malignant. So it really is very helpful. And this is really good to show that the hyperplastic hurtful cell nodules, the tests were really not positive, even the number is small, were not positive in those. Because this is what I see mostly in the practice, because some of these nodules which are oncocytic nodules, either in the background of thyroiditis or in long-standing goiter, can give uh, can be very challenging on cytology and will either be called as AUS plus or follicular neoplasm. 
And I think this is actually one of my really interest uh, paper that I, I really reference a lot. And that is the one which is, uh, which was the meta-analysis. And I really like these meta-analysis because it kind of gives you a very good bird's eye view of what is happening in the literature and really putting all the data together. Um, granted, these studies are very heterogeneous. They have different biases associated with it, but it is really interesting to see that if you look at the all three and four Bethesda three and four thyroid nodules based upon a Firma and Kairoseq version two, you can really um, see that the sensitivity and specificity differences there and the negative and positive predictive value. So Kairoseq version two even was giving a good positive predictivity value when it came um, to looking at the Bethesda three and four nodules. So these both tests were neck to neck, but I think the Thyroseq version two was actually performing much better. So this is putting all these studies together. So this kind of gives us a view that when you have a panel which is composed of mutations and fusions and different genetic alterations, it provides you a little bit more information and um, what and kind of assesses what will be the follow-up on these. So taking this in line, this is another paper which was uh, published uh, in thyroid in 2019. And this has already been discussed by Yuri that if you see the percentage of positive nodules unspecified in this study where the amino acids were really not spe uh, specified and specified where the amino acids were listed, you can see the high malignancy rate nearly everything was malignant in DRAF and its variants. Um, and if you look at the RAS, taking all together, there was a still a high malignancy rate in these cases. And then naturally, Yuri discussed uh, the paper which was published in JAMA Site uh, Oncology. Now, I'm just going to tell you what has been our experience. And most of this, we put together on the testing of the Thyroseq version three, which is the latest version. So. In this, um, so this is actually is on the PAN website uh, for all the endocrinologists and surgeons to refer to. This is the internal diagram we have developed, uh, like a pathway, how these specimens should be submitted for uh, different molecular tests. Um, these molecular tests are ordered at this point by clinicians and surgeons. We do not reflex them based upon the pathologist cannot order these, so they are still uh, reflect ordered by the clinician, but they are reflexed based upon the final cytologic diagnosis. At this point, our repeat FNA rate uh, is less than 1%. We do submit uh, because we all mostly go on site on these cases. So we do take a molecular vial. If we think on on-site evaluation or telecytology evaluation, that this nodule is not outright callable as benign. The folks who do only uh, FNAs without a pathologist on site do take a molecular vial based upon ultrasound characteristics of these nodules. And as we know that this has still a lot of variability on different reads of ultrasound, but this is our pathway at uh, PEN that we follow for molecular testing. So this is just, I'm gonna show you a few cases here. Um, this is one of the cases where the nodule was really suspicious. It was biopsy. And as you can see here, this was the cytology here and beautiful grooves, no inclusions, elongated cells. And this on the follow-up was a NIFTP. And this had on cytology and thyroseq and RAS mutations with the 60 to 70% probability of cancer. This is another nodule, which is actually was my case. On cytology, it had beautiful microfollicles. There was nothing else in this, no nuclear ATP, no nuclear pleomorphism. I, I call this as a follicular neoplasm, submitted it for thyroseq, and this had NRAS and TERT promoter mutations. I actually looked at the search path of this. The majority of the tumor was um, an encapsulated follicular pattern neoplasm with nuclear features of PTC. It did have some areas of invasion in it, but on the um, certain areas, as you can see, there's beautiful necrosis here, and the cells are very dark, and they are associated. So this was actually a component of pure poorly differentiated carcinoma arising in a, uh, in a, uh, a follicular variant of PTC. 
this is just another case which was a hurtful cell nodule and this was also had actually no mutations and this was a hurtful cell adenoma so what is our experience i think our in our experience i think the best way to look at the data is to really look at the benign call rate of a molecular test and as you can see in our hands uh, the cases that underwent surgery the negative predictive value and the positive predictive value for even Bethesda 3 and 4 was excellent in our hands. And as you can see, there was more malignancy rates or positive predictive value higher in the uh, follicular neoplasm category. So the benign call rate, which I think really is matter, instead of thinking about it as a risk of malignancy or predictive value, which is great clinical terms, but I really looked at more looking at this as calling it, what is the benign call rate when you do submit cases classified as AUS plus and follicular neoplasm? So the benign call rate in our experience for nodules diagnosed as AUS, which is naturally should be understandable, was higher, almost 82%, as compared to the nodules which were called as Bethesda 4 or follicular neoplasm. So I think this test really is very helpful in our hands um, go, prospectively going uh, for these indeterminate category. We re really, there was, which was very interesting, which is also pointed out in the study by Stewart, that the, the most common mutations that we found was RAS. And I was really surprised that there were 45 independent molecular signature. So this test was providing us with a much more of a greater data that can be utilized for patient management. But interestingly, the risk of malignancy was only 64%, which was a little higher than the Stewart study when there was RAS mutations alone, but it rose to 100% when it was associated with copy number alterations or other mutations, which has also been shown by other studies. So I think this test can really be utilized to really help guide. And at this point, if we have a RAS mutation alone um, in, in our dual, which is on ultrasound, does not have any features of invasion or microcalcifications, um, the, our surgeons really do just a lobectomy. And most cases are just managed by lobectomy alone. So we, I think this really test really describes how these low and high risk cases can be there and managed. So thank you so much for giving me time. These are tough times, but I think it brings us together by the virtual field and really having, uh, I really feel every day blessed that I have good friends, good family, and I have uh, really people who are still willing to hear me at least for half an hour or so. So thank you so much, Mark. Now I'm just gonna move to the poll slide again. Um, the history has been read uh, by Yuri uh, before, and these are your uh, uh, choices at the bottom. So you can go ahead and vote. Uh, terrific. Well, I want to uh, um, take this opportunity to thank um, both of our presenters today. Uh, this was truly um, an outstanding presentation. And I just want to remind everyone that on Monday, this will be available. If you're interested, um, you can certainly uh, come back and you can watch and listen to this um, uh, terrific presentation as many times as you like. There, um, I want to just pose uh, two questions. One um, is, we think about mutation analysis um, from the perspective of diagnosis and making decisions um, regarding the management of indeterminate thyroid nodules. In your mind, um, do we put that aside once we have the histology in terms of stratifying the risk um, of those uh, tumors as it relates to low risk, high risk, or intermediate risk? Um, does, do we just put that in another bucket and move on with the management of that patient? Or should that stay within our mindset um, in terms of how we address um, that patient's risk of recurrent disease or risk of dying from that disease? Yuri, you want to take this yeah. on? I want to say that in many cases, we have a very clear cut uh, histology that 
that nodule is not enco is encapsulated, there is absolutely no any evidence for invasion, or in opposite, there is a widely invasive, there is poorly differentiated, when I don't think that molecular testing will contribute much. But there is a category, there is a proportion of cases where even histology may be challenging, and those in those cases, molecular testing may provide additional prognostic information. So I, I do agree with Yuri. So um, uh, Mark, the, we had a one case which was actually was called malignant um, on histology and on the um, you on the uh, parasitic test it had a TSHR um, receptor mutations and looking back at it, at it it was a functional nodule and it had this capsular irregularity nothing else which was listed as uh, minimal capsular invasion. So actually that was a benign nodule. So in those challenging cases where the histology is still, is still very challenging, I think the prior data really helps. And definitely in majority of the cases, the histology should be the one which should guide the, uh, the management further. Great. My very last question posed by Dr. Bergman is, um, in plus thyroseq, low risk is follow-up um, sonograms adequate or should repeat aspirations be performed? I will say that in most cases, if thyroseq is negative and we have called it plus, the follow-up with sonograms is, is, I think is adequate. I agree. Terrific. Listen, everyone, um, we have re uh, reached the um, nine o'clock hour. Um, I want to, again, thank everyone for attending and thank our presenters for an outstanding presentation um, this morning. Um, and I uh, hope that everyone will join us next week and want to thank all of you and also hope that everyone stays safe. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye now.